Hello, Robert Neely here again, and uh, spoken about some ideas about why hypnosis might be something of use to us to learn and to bring into our practice, and how Erickson in particular and his approach uh, contributes to that in a more focused uh, and more respectful way. So if hypnosis is that wonderful, and Ericksonian hypnosis in particular is that fantastic, how come the whole world isn't using it? And uh, it's a puzzle to me, but um, and also it's part of my passion to to teach this in different places and to, to offer these experiences to try and let more people know about the benefits and interest people in learning about them and bringing them into their work. But there are some uh, weird stuff around hypnosis that persists. Nothing to do with the facts of hypnosis but it's to do with the company that hypnosis has kept down through the ages. Uh, if people were learning hypnosis with me and uh, they go home and they're with their friends the, that night and say, I'm learning hypnosis, the friends say, don't, you don't, you're doing it now, you're looking at me, uh, don't do that, you're, you're hypnotizing me. There's all of this kind of nonsense about the look into my eyes and I'm going to control you and so on. And uh, th there's been a lot of uh, hoo-ha and nonsense about what hypnosis can and cannot do. Um, stage hypnosis is based on the whole idea that if someone goes up onto stage, then they're willing to make a fool of themselves and do, do stupid things. And uh, if nobody knew about what was supposed to happen on stage, I, I bet that uh, someone who went there for the first time would wonder what, what was going on. And the idea that uh, from stage hypnosis is that the hypnotist is powerful, usually charismatic, usually male, and does something to some passive recipient. And there's some association here with magic, which is the work of a magician who again is the person who has the power doing things to someone who is without power, totally passive, totally uh, unable to contribute to anything. There's another bit of uh, uh, mythology that, uh, that uh, misconceptions around hypnosis, and that is to do with this notion of sorcery, where you can buy a book of spells, and all you need to do is read the words. There's there's power in the words. It's not the reader, but it's the words themselves. All you need to do is speak the words, and those words will again have an effect on some poor, unsuspecting, and passive recipient. And some parts of this notion are still active in some circles that use hypnosis in the form of hypnotic scripts, so that uh, someone just reads a, a pro forma a script out to someone and that's supposed to do it. But again, the client, like the recipient of uh, spells, the, the recipient is passive. And the power is now not so much in the speaker, but in the words themselves. The other association that, that, that uh, contaminates the hypnosis, it's like a prejudice, it's totally absurd, but Hypnosis became popular about a hundred years ago, a little over, at the same time that general anaesthetics were coming into their own. And hypnosis borrowed some of the jargon of general anaesthetics. And in some circles, people talk in relation to hypnosis about putting me out, putting me under, making me unconscious, uh, I don't remember anything, I might behave badly. And uh, so, again, the idea of an anaesthetic, the purpose of an anaesthetic actually, is to stop the, the recipient being active. They just, they just uh, hypno, they just anaesthetise so the surgeon can do what it, what needs to be done. So all of these associations, and also uh, it's been associated in some religious circles. It's been associated with the devil. Oh yeah. Anyhow, that's part of the prejudice that surrounds hypnosis, and no wonder. Uh, if that, if that, uh, those associations are there, no wonder there's some kind of uh, reluctance in 
in people to to try hypnosis and reluctance in, in, in I would say people who should know better, but anyhow, people who are, who are working in the helping professions, there's a reluctance to get involved with anything like that. It's, uh, it's abhorrent. And certainly if hypnosis were like that, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with it. But um, I think that Erickson was very helpful in getting past those prejudicial blocks by talking about the common everyday trends. And he said that anyone can get absorbed in reading a book, watching a movie, looking out of a window and daydreaming. You get into it, you, you, you get absorbed in it, and time goes by and various things happen. And, and we all do that. It's, it's part of our everyday life. There's no, nothing weird about it, nothing strange about it. It's just normal. And um, so if we think of hypnosis as an extension of that, then that starts to bring it to ground start to make it more ordinary, more accessible for us learning it, and also for clients wanting to have the benefits of it. So I'll say more about that the next time, but just to introduce this idea that hypnosis, although historically it's had some weird company, thank goodness it's starting to come out into the light and people are seeing it for what it is, it simply is an experience that involves focus, and involves an absorption as an extension of what Erickson called common everyday trends. So I'll leave you with that thought, and thanks for listening, and uh, more next time.